Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Evolution Show. So grab a cup of tea, sit back, relax, and let's catch up. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today I have two very special items that I want to share with you. The first is a beautiful Luna Moth dome. This was made by our fabrication department in upstate New York and it uh, is one of the biggest domes that we have available. The base is about 12 inches and with the glass dome, it stands about 30 inches tall. We took the dome off so it would be easier to show you some details about it. Um, it's very sturdily constructed. It can be shipped all over. So if you're interested in ordering this and you live in California, don't worry about it. We can ship it to you. I wanna point out a few details about the construction. Um, we put this sandy uh, base on the, on the bottom here. We have natural moss. This is natural moss that has been dried and we positioned it all around the base and it goes all throughout, all the way to the very tippy top. And the main base is constructed from a piece of natural driftwood. And it's always difficult to find driftwood that is the right size and shape for a display that you wanna make. So this was a very good find that we were able to find. So this display contains about 20 Luna moths and one sunset moth here. Uh, Luna moths are native to North America. Sunset moths are native to Madagascar. Luna moths are nocturnal. Sunset moths are diurnal. So there's no universe in which this would naturally occur, this kind of an agglomeration. Uh, but we wanted to do something fun and fantastical and whimsical. We make scientifically accurate displays all of the time. Um, but when we created this particular display, we wanted to just have fun and do something, uh, something fantastical. So that's what we did here. Luna moths, uh, you'll see, have these extensions on the bottoms of their wings. And it turns out that these serve a very important defense mechanism function for them. One of their natural predators is bats. And the bats get confused um, when they use their echolocation to try and hunt the moths. They get confused because these extra pieces sort of flap around wildly when the moths are flying. And so it creates a lot of noise and um, sort of distraction within their echolocation mechanism. And bats have a hard time targeting them. Another feature is the eye markings on their wings. This is also a common defense mechanism for other types of predators. You'll see this often in other butterflies and moths. This is pretty common. They have these really beautiful fuzzy antennae that look kind of like, uh, like fern leaves. 
They're very beautiful. The primary purpose of their antennae is to detect pheromones during mating. Luna moths have an exceptionally short uh, adult life cycle, lifespan. Uh, they're only in the adult phase for about a week, so they have to do their business rather quickly. And in fact, they live such a short amount of time that they, they have mouths, but they don't actually function in their adult phase. So they don't eat at all during that phase. They only survive off of stored fat cells. So, so that's some facts about Luna moths. Uh, sunset moths are obviously different um, in their coloration. Luna moths are sort of just one pale green color. Sunset moths are a veritable rainbow of colors. Um, turns out these colors are actually not a result of any pigmentation of the scales. The colors are actually just an optical illusion. The scales are covered in basically microscopic prisms that take light and refract it. Um, if you've ever had, you know, used a prism, you know, it takes light and reflects, refracts it into all the different colors of the rainbow. Their prisms that are in their scales are constructed in such a way that they only reflect certain types of light. Uh, for many years, uh, sunset moths were misidentified as butterflies and there are several reasons for that. They're diurnal and most moths are nocturnal, so they are unusual in that sense. And also, one of the first specimens that was brought back for study, it uh, had the head of a different butterfly placed on it. And so that was very confusing because butterflies and moths have very different types of antennae. Moth antennae tend to be very fuzzy and um, that's one of their distinguishing characteristics. And so that was one other reason why people um, thought that this was a butterfly and not a moth, but that got straightened out eventually. Uh, the indigenous people who live on Madagascar call this sunset moth the noble spirit. And the reason for that is because when it's in its cocoon phase, it looks like a, a, like a, a corpse wrapped in a shroud. And then obviously when the moth comes out of it and is born, uh, it's born, born into its new phase of life. Um, that's a sort of a spiritual rebirth. Um, so it's a symbol of the afterlife. It's a symbol of the soul. Um, it's a very beautiful and meaningful, um, meaningful piece of nature. So I hope that you um, think that this display is as beautiful as I do. We put a lot of effort into it and I think it's really unique and special. So the second dome I wanted to talk to you about today is a beetle dome. So we did a moth dome, now we're doing a beetle dome. And this dome is definitely smaller. It's about, I would say, 12 to 15 inches tall and maybe about six inches wide. And it, the base of it is different. It has a glass top that is slightly fluted here at the bottom, which I think is a nice detail. And under the base, 
you can see it has these nubs here and that allows it to sit slightly off the table here. And so this dome has been made to look and feel a little more antique than the moth dome. The base has been painted black, but it has some areas of sort of distressed um, you know, details added. Uh, then the interior part of the base here has been painted yellow, but it also has little flecks of black. So this is something that is a ton of effort was put into a lot of small details. Very interesting to look at. We have the natural dried moss and some small rocks and stones on this one. So in addition to the driftwood base, you get the moss and you get the stones. So another interesting complex sort of environment has been built for these beetles. And this is a study in rhinoceros beetles, um, also known as Dynastinae. And uh, this is a very, very big variety of rhinoceros beetles, some of which are really quite uncommon. And each one of them has been articulated to fit precisely its spot on the base here. You can see each leg is wrapping around the piece of wood, each just as it would in, you know, in a natural environment. Again, this is not something that is scientifically accurate. These beetles come from all over the world and don't necessarily live in the same environments, but it doesn't mean we don't like to look at them together. It's a very interesting um, compare and contrast. You can see all the different types and shapes of horns that they have. This one, for example, is Eupatorus gracilicornis, um, which is the five-horned rhinoceros beetle. And it has, as you can see, five horns. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, there are a variety of different horn shapes and sizes. Some, sometimes these beetles are called unicorn beetles. Um, they're more often called rhinoceros beetles, but they all have these huge, huge appendages in common. And in fact, the size and the length and width of their appendage is uh, directly proportional to their physical strength and um, overall health. So the better fed, the uh, more favorable their environment, the bigger and stronger they grow. Um, what's interesting about rhinoceros beetles is that even though they look fearsome, they are completely harmless to humans. They don't bite, they don't sting, um, and in fact, a lot of people keep them as pets because of that. They're great, um, they're great cohabitants with humans. We have absolutely nothing to fear from them. They use their horns for um, defense. Uh, uh, for defense sometimes, um, also during mating. Um, that's one of the main reasons why they have them. And But they also so serve a more functional purpose. They use the horns for digging as well. So some of them um, might dig for food or water or to create a burrow. So they use these um, horns for all different types of purposes. Um, you can see that they're all mostly black and brown. That's common with with rhinoceros beetles, they kind of try to blend in. And um, their, their main defense from predators uh, is, is, in addition to their horn, is just their size, their overall size. They're not, you know, 
they're not the easiest guys to, to pick off, so they're very formidable in that sense. All rhinoceros beetles have wings, even though they're tucked in in most of these cases, but they all have the ability to fly. They're not necessarily the most graceful flyers because of their size, um, but they can fly when they need to, um, if they need to go from you know short distances. So I really love this display. It is completely striking. The attention to detail is absolutely beautiful. The way that each, each leg, each piece of each leg, each toe wraps around um, the base is so naturalistic, so realistic. It really is a work of art. So I hope that you like this one as much as I do. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode about our beautiful bug domes. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you about that. I like to end every episode by reading a few comments from social media. So the first comment today is from Instagram and it is from Jacob Neff. We had posted a picture of an astrology skull that we were sending to a customer in Canada. And so this is a skull, it's actually a resin skull that has astrology sort of decorations on it, like symbols and, and pictograms and stuff like that. And um, so Jacob Neff had asked us on Instagram if we still make these. And um, the technical answer to that is we don't actually make them ourselves, we get them from a manufacturer. But I think what Jacob was getting at is that um, he had stopped by our store and hadn't seen them in stock. And so I wanted to bring this up as an opportunity to discuss the fact that our store stock does not necessarily match our web stock and vice versa. Um, our web orders ship out of our warehouse, which is in upstate New York. And so they have a completely different stock level system than we do down in the store in New York City. So it's very possible that you come in the store and see something that's not available or not in stock on the website. And it is also possible that you go on the website and see something that is in stock um, that's not available in the store. So um, definitely reach out to us if you see something either in the store or on the website and then don't see it again or don't see it available the next time that you visit uh, because it's very possible that we do have it in stock just in a different location. So definitely reach out to us if you see something in particular that you're interested in. We can always make arrangements to ship it to you wherever you are. So thank you, Jacob, for the question. Our next comment is from Facebook. It's from Sean Armstrong. Uh, and it is from our episode that we did a few weeks back on uh, jewelry for Valentine's Day. One of the pieces we had featured was our authentic, genuine um, Campo del Cielo meteorite pendant, which is one of our most popular items. And Sean Armstrong mentioned that his wife loves her meteorite necklace, and I agree, Sean. And I like to believe maybe that you are a descendant or a relative of Neil. That would make me feel very cool indeed if I had a, a you know, a relative of a spaceman endorsing our space products. Our last comment for today is from Instagram. Uh, it's in response to a picture of a piece of copper light that we had posted. And Bad Bad Bean says, damn, my boy must have had Taco Bell. Red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. You try it. Red leather, <laughs> red leather, yellow leather. <laughs> Super slow. Well, yeah, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much that's going to help with the... Peter Piper, Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. How many pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? That's pretty good. Um, Peter Piper picked a pecker. <laughs> She sells seashells by the seashore. That one is common, right? It's seashell, she sells seashells. <laughs> I can't speak. You know, that's my stuff. You know, to be fair, it's my second language. Uh -huh.